Hi, uh, my name is Ben Batorsky. Really excited to be giving this talk on ethics and bias in natural language processing. Uh, this is a topic that's really uh, important to me and I think really interesting. Uh, there's a lot, been a lot of developments in sort of research around this and hopefully uh, hope to share some of that with you and uh, hopefully have some conversation in the chat uh, as, you, as you watch this. Oops. Uh, so just a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm a data scientist. I've spent most of my career focused on NLP. Uh, I have my PhD in policy analysis, and I'm part of the Ciox Health Real World Data Team. So just a little bit about Ciox Health. It's a health inform uh, information management company, basically uh, taking uh, data from a number of US hospitals um, and then sort of providing that, providing insights uh, for uh, researchers and for kind of development around healthcare. Uh, using a series of sort of NLP production pipelines. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be talking particularly about the work that I'm doing, but I think it's really important um, for anybody who's sort of using NLP to think about these. And these are definitely things that are kind of on the table as we, as we uh, do this work. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about history. I think history is a good place to start. Uh, I'm using old days, like, you know, in quotes, very flexibly, uh, just saying that uh, this is sort of, I'm, I'm bucketing machine learning into like pre-neural net days and sort of post-neural net days. Um, and not to say that these techniques are not uh, applicable or useful anymore or continue to be used or of more relevance more now than ever, but I just want to sort of talk about like what is the, the sort of recent developments that have driven a kind of um, a need for re-examination of, of uh, the priorities of NLP. Uh, and so just on the left here, we have an example of a very kind of old machine translation system. These old systems were sort of state machines. They were parsers that would uh, follow kind of a deterministic path based on uh, what uh, what it was seeing, uh, what the state of the parser was. Um, and so these, you know, worked for a very specific set of um, uh, rules. If it fell into the rule set, then it was actually pretty good. Uh, but otherwise, it wasn't uh, very good and wasn't generally good enough to, to sort of be used in general cases. Um, uh, a lot of machine learning besides that was sort of uh, required a lot of hand engineering, a lot of domain expertise, but also on the other side, a lot of transparency, right? Uh, a lot of work went into sort of this side of uh, machine learning or continues to go into the side of machine learning of actually generating these uh, these features, um, creating features that can then run into the model and have uh, parameters that are learned uh, towards a certain objective. Um, so, you know, this is a really important side of machine learning still, uh, but uh, what neural nets, uh, one of the things that neural nets sort of offered was the ability to kind of uh, learn uh, representations, particularly uh, when it comes to language, uh, where it needed to essentially create some sort of informative representation uh, of individual tokens in sort of a series of text. And so here on the left here, I have the kind of that uh, earlier sort of language models and very briefly a language model is essentially just predicting a word based on the context. Um, that's sort of the objective of a language model. Uh, and, you know, they came before the 2000s, but uh, there was sort of prolifer proliferation of them uh, around that. Um, and so one of the uh, sort of computational intensive parts of it, we're learning these representations of the individual tokens. You can see here in this sort of matrix C uh, where the individual uh, tokens are sort of being um, represented as some you know, vector of information. Uh, and those learned representations were uh, super useful uh, for uh, that particular task, for the language model task. But uh, if you wanted to use them just generally as sort of a representation of, of words, they were not uh, as useful. And uh, in training these language models, you sort of had to uh, sort of train that from scratch, which took a lot of time and just uh, generally required a lot of uh, data to be able to create those sort of reliable representations. So one of the major uh, benefits or the major major uh, developments in 2013 was the call of paper talking about uh, word embeddings, where it's a simple algorithm for uh, creating embeddings for individual words based on their context. So by feeding it sort of a large corpora of uh, language data of just sort of free text, uh, you can learn representations of individual terms that have something that have embedded in them uh, some sense of the context of the terms. Uh, and that context was sort of shown to have some, uh, some representation of meaning. Um, so the example of being able to take these representations and sort of add them together and subtract them, the, the canonical example of taking king, subtracting the vector for, for man and adding the vector for woman uh, ends up with a vector that's fairly close to queen. 
Um, so that's the idea that if there's some meaningness kind of embedded into these representations. Uh, but you know, these representations, the individual dimensions don't have like a sort of readily interpretable meaning uh, on them. So it's a little bit different from the other kind of framework that I kind of set up um, in a very simple way. And of course, I'm sort of uh, obfuscating a lot of detail here, uh, but I want to sort of get at the point that um, these representations now are very useful for sort of plugging into uh, other applications, creating uh, features that are based on these individual terms. Uh, but they also require a lot of uh, uh, text to be able to create representations that are kind of sensible. Um, but you know, it's a really uh, awesome and impressive uh, piece of technology and method. And so they've proliferated, proliferated all kind of all over. Um, so there's medical terminology to VEC, which are embeddings based on, based on medical records, which are really interesting. And then a ton of different uh, word embeddings for different languages. Of course, still you need language resources to be able to train a word embedding that has any sort of, uh, makes any sort of sense. And there's certain uh, limitations, particularly of the, you know, the word to VEC algorithms as proposed uh, that makes it a little bit less flexible for other sort of uh, types of language with other sort of structures. But I'm not really going to dig into that, but um, uh, it's, it's worth noting. So now kind of jumping ahead, uh, everything is now like BERT. Everything is now transformers. Uh, these large neural language models uh, have become the state of the art uh, across a bunch of different tasks. Um, and uh, on the left here, I just have some of the, one of the translation tasks and sort of the state of the art there. Uh, all of these are neural models. Uh, and you can see the ones that are kind of starting to uh, beat out the others are these transformers. Uh, you know, this was the original transformers paper. Um, but if we look at just recent days, uh, these models are getting uh, larger and larger with more and more parameters and requiring larger and larger data sets. Um, so that's an important thing to, to note that they have to consume more and more data. So to be able to have one of these models, you have to have data available. Um, and that means you have to sort of uh, pull in um, uh, the, the data that, that, that this sort of model requires. Um, but uh, what this, the upshot of this is, is we're actually seeing um, really powerful results. So like this is Google Translate and showing the transition from, and this is in 2016, right? So this is uh, already kind of outdated, but the transition from phrase-based translation, which was before the neural models uh, to this uh, uh, neural model translation technique. And you can see the performance, you know, like it's, the performance doesn't look like it's a huge jump that has happened, but if you actually look at the output, you can read these and see that the more that the uh, the phrase-based uh, machine translation, which is like somewhat closer to the, that old sort of uh, 1950s example than it is to modern technology, is a little bit you know you can sort of get the idea, but it's not really like readable. It's kind of uh, a little bit garbled. Um, but the neural models almost seem similar to the human. Of course, these are cherry-picked examples, um, but uh, that's sort of what we get out of it. Um, but I mean, uh, thinking about the amount of uh, data that goes into this, uh, we have to think about what are the sources that are being pulled in. Um, and we, in that case, we have to think of the principle of this garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and I kind of like the point to this example. This was a Microsoft in 2016 released a, a Twitter uh, bot that essentially was supposed to develop and grow based on its conversations with the internet generally. And you think a company like Microsoft would know uh, what the internet is composed of. And of course, the bot was immediately targeted by people that were trying to turn it into something uh, that would say numerous problematic things and they were successful, right? So uh, it makes sense, right? Like if you put a bunch of uh, bias, uh, problematic statements uh, into a model, it's going to learn those, that bias is going to learn those problematic statements. So it's worth examining with these larger models and these large, these methods that we're sort of, um, sort of prolifer proliferating everywhere, uh, what are the sources that are being pulled in? So um, uh, for word to vec uh, the original paper was trained on Google News. Uh, BERT and GPT-3 uh, pull from Wikipedia. Uh, just these large uh, uh, data sets of, of language. Uh, GPT-3 even goes more ambitious, pulls a bunch of different things from Common Crawl, has its own sort of uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, which have their own sort of uh, caveats there. Um, Common Crawl, including a bunch of different web sources, things like Reddit and other, and other things that are available, right? Because they need to consume all this data to be able to, to achieve the performance that they're able to get to. But 
again, what is the content? What are the perspectives being represented in these different data sets? And that's sort of, you can get some kind of easy stats that would show you that there's maybe some problems with just kind of pulling in as much data as possible. And so uh, if you think about Wikipedia, uh, a survey of uh, just all language Wikipedia showed that just the vast majority of editors are male, uh, that there is a, a vast underrepresentation of women among biographies, and that even among that small percentage of biographies, a lot of them get recommended for uh, deletion, uh, which would suggest that there is a general sort of um, attitude or general sort of perspective that's being represented in Wikipedia. Not to put any judgment on what that, that perspective is, but it's to say that that, that is something worth being conscious of. In Google News, you know, this is not, this is kind of old news, uh, but newsrooms tend to be dominated by men. Uh, there tends to be an overrepresentation of white men, particularly. Uh, men are also more often the face of articles across different topics and outlets. Um, so if we're pulling in that, we have a certain perspective being represented there. Uh, internet users, you know, there's a little bit more of a mix of like who is being represented. Um, but uh, w when we talk about Reddit, with Reddit does a great job of making a lot of its data available, but who are Reddit users? Mostly male, mostly white, right? So these are showing that there is a particular set of perspectives that are being represented in the data that's being fed to this, um, to these models. And so you might ask, all right, well, so what, right? Like, what is it? Uh, what does it matter? What is the impact of something like that? And uh, one example, one kind of powerful example of this is this, ex uh, this investigation that ProPublica did of this um, risk scoring model that based on a uh, person's record would score whether the person was likely to reoffend, uh, you know, when they were being sentenced. Um, and they found that uh, black defendants were much more likely to have higher risk scores and to be predicted to reoffend, uh, even when uh, a comparable white defendant uh, who you know did reoffend or had a history of arrest um, uh, when when they were compared to that, um, and so you have to think about like what is this model trained on? We're not actually sure. Like I can't say that this is you know a BERT model or something like that, and that's almost the problem, right? We don't actually know what was the data that was feeding into this model. We don't know what features they're using because it's you know a private company uh, and they're not going to release that information, uh, which makes it even more problematic. What is the data that's being uh, uh, it's being trained on. It's, you know, you can't say that there's particularly something intrinsic to different groups of people that makes them more likely or less likely to do these different things. Um, it, it, there's, uh, if you're training on historical data, you're going to pull in all the historical biases that exist there. And this, uh, rep this is, can be also pulled in uh, from GPT-2. Uh, if you use GPT-2 as sort of a language generation and you give it a prompt that has some sort of gender or race um, uh, information in it, it generates pretty problematic passages to just kind of show, demonstrate that it has ingested the biases of the data that it's been trained on. Um, so this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about these are like potential impacts and, you know, uh, whether generated text is going to affect someone's life, it's, it's not clear, but there are a number of other examples uh, of uh, the kind of the latest models kind of um, failing the test uh, of being fair or uh, having uh, bias being considered. And so I'm going to step back a little bit, right, and talk about like, what am I, what do I mean when I say ethics and bias? And there's a ton of different definitions, right? I'm going to focus on like a very like narrow subset, right? Because not a long talk uh, it could, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that are talking very uh, carefully about all of the stuff. Uh, I'm going to focus on like one particular aspect of it. So ethics is like sort of a set of moral principles. You can read more about like this kind of principled AI, which has a bunch of different uh, elements to it. I'm going to focus mainly on fairness and non-discrimination and the design in favor of uh, inclusivity. Bias uh, just generally is a uh, disproportionate weight in favor or against a particular uh, thing or idea. Um, so again, that's this sort of to the point that there's nothing uh, particularly intrinsic about the particular group of people that makes them more likely to, you know, uh, behave a certain kind of way. Uh, that it's just if you train on historical data, you're going to have all of the, the the systems that existed historically uh, that would sort of um, portray that that idea that there's different groups have have these different uh, qualities. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how to address uh, issues of bias, how to you know promote um, uh, some some uh, examples of it, and then some ways of uh, sort of addressing it.
So uh, here's just a couple of types or a handful of types of um, bias in machine learning. And this machine learning generally, I recommend you, you take a look at this paper. It has a ton more examples and they're really interesting and well uh, uh, articulated. Um, but some of the ones that I'm mainly going to be talking about is essentially historical bias and representation bias. So you can think of historical bias as that, you know, sort of compass example that I showed before um, that uh, because the incarceration rates are of different populations are uh, a, a product of sort of the institutions uh, that exist currently and existed in the past, um, we're going to sort of bake that into any model that's going to be trained on historical data. Representation uh, bias, uh, you know, uh, I have the example here of ImageNet, uh, you know, uh, has certain types of people doing certain activities. So if it sees another type of person uh, doing a activity that's not stereotyping, it's it's going to have a harder time. Uh, uh, it's it, any model that's trained that is going to have a harder time recognizing that, uh, or going to assume a particular type of person is doing a particular type of activity, and so that's kind of a problem. Um, so those are two major ones that I'm going to talk about. Um, I, I like to focus on one particular example. I think this is a really good example of word embeddings and showing the gender and racial bias uh, that's sort of inherent in them. Very easy to kind of pull this out and take a look at this. Um, so on the left here, I have this sort of representation of the gender bias. Uh, on the y-axis, you have the word she, and on the x-axis, you have the word he, and you have sort of the projection, the similarity uh, of uh, these different uh, uh, occupation terms on each of these uh, different gendered words. And you know, ideally, you want to see that they're the same, right? That there's nothing intrinsic about women that makes them more or less likely to be an architect, uh, but there's something historically about that. Uh, so, you know, you can see that homemaker is has a higher loading on she and a lower loading on he. Um, so you can see that kind of bias there. The same is true for racial ethnic bias. Uh, again, you'd expect to see that the top occupations that are similar to these uh, ethnic groups um, would be about the same. But you can see that's not the case, right? And you can see that there's a bias that's kind of baked into it. Um, this is kind of a busy slide, but I thought it was actually really fascinating that you can sort of trace history in word embeddings. Um, you can actually see that the amount of the bias, uh, you know, in, uh, towards uh, towards the, the women, the, the similarity to, to gendered um, terms is actually uh, correlates pretty strongly with the occupational difference. And so you can see that there's more women in uh, nursing and that bias is, is very high. So you can see that kind of correlation. Um, and this. Uh, visual on the right is kind of interesting because you can see that if you train your word embeddings on uh, previous sort of generations uh, prior to kind of women, the, the height of the of women's movements uh, in the 60s and 70s, you can see that there's a lot more correlation in the adjectives being used to refer to women um, uh, before those movements uh, than after. And that's kind of interesting just to show that word embeddings are encoding the, the historical bias, which is just um, kind of a fascinating. This paper is really interesting. I recommend it. Um, and you can also play around with this yourself. Uh, I have a uh, notebook that allows you to just kind of mess with this a little bit. You can reproduce that uh, kind of results that we saw before pretty quickly. Uh, Vincent Marmadam uh, from uh, Rasa has uh, a package that's uh, called What Lies, which allows you to sort of explore word embeddings and do you know similar explorations like this, which I find really interesting as well. So now transitioning a little bit, let's talk a little bit more about fairness and what I mean when I'm uh, talking about this you know, sort of ethical use, principled use of AI, and particularly with a focus on fairness. Um, so Cynthia Dwork, um, Finding Fairness, really interesting talk, uh, talked a little bit about some definitions of fairness um, and some like easy ways to kind of like look at what is fair and what might not be fair. Uh, a group level fairness, the statistical parity idea where um, you have an underlying distribution of the population and you expect to have a similar sort of distribution uh, in your positive and negative class, say you're trying to predict who will repay a loan. Uh, if you see in one class that one group is overrepresented uh, uh, significantly, then you might want to think like, okay, maybe the model is learning something I don't want it to learn. The same is true for the individual level fairness. You have two individuals and uh, if they're similar, they should have a similar outcome. If they don't, uh, the model might be learning some feature, learning too much from some feature, or uh, you know, uh, essentially just encoding some kind of stereotype. Um, so let's take a look at that in the context of NLP, right? And so this was a interesting uh, uh, survey that the ACL did uh, of basically all the all, like a, a 
large set of languages and what were the resources that were available labeled and unlabeled data. Uh, and so you can see that there's that group five, and this is sort of their grouping, this their clustering of this. Uh, group five um, is kind of where you want all languages to be, where it has a ton of data available. Uh, but really, it's only representing a very small uh, fraction of the of languages. And about 90% of languages have basically no labeled data available. Um, so we can already see that this is kind of not representative and not particularly fair to a lot of speakers. Only about one third uh, of all speakers are being uh, represented, uh, are being well represented. You can see sort of the languages that the languages that you'd expect are sort of are sort of there. So you can see that that's uh, kind of problematic. And it's likely not going to change much when you see where sort of the uh, labelers sort of exist, where the people that are doing this work sort of exist. Um, uh, much more representation of a particular part of the world and uh, more representation of those languages that we saw in that sort of higher group. And so this location of mechanical Turk labelers. Label, label. Um, and so what does this mean, right? Like maybe you, you're not compelled by the fact that it's just not fair to not represent large swaths of the people, but it, you could also say that it's going to hurt uh, our ability to create models that are robust uh, across different languages or have uh, similar performance across different languages. Um, this is from uh, Bert Lang. It's sort of a, a, a list of a number of different Bert models uh, trained on different languages and their performance on a set of different metrics. You can see this variation, even though this is kind of a mishmash of different data sets, you can see that the performance varies and that the MBERT, the multilingual BERT, the model that's trained to do multiple languages, uh, does poor, uh, uh, much worse than these single language models. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it just goes to show that uh, if you're interested in the performance and the, the top performing models, um, it, it makes sense to have uh, this sort of better representation. Um, and I thought these two points, these two quotes made uh, these points very strong. Um, so Sebastian Ruder's uh, article on uh, uh, pushing people to work on languages beyond English, really powerful statement um, uh, that these, this technology is not accessible if it's only available for, say, English speakers with the standard accent or just that, that group of that one third of the population. Uh, and also, we can't say that the, the models, the, the systems that we're designing are representative if uh, we just have this kind of uh, echo chamber of, uh, of languages, languages that are particularly sim similar. So uh, it, one, we need to have better representation so that our models are more robust and see more uh, linguistic phenomena. And uh, we can be a little bit more sure that it's learning something uh, about language generally rather than just uh, uh, fitting to a specific set of patterns that exist in the well-represented languages. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about some strategies, and this is by no means comprehensive. There's a ton of work on this. Uh, uh, I just thought that some examples might be useful. Um, uh, one, and this is particularly in prediction, so you might want to have multi-accuracy targets. Uh, you sort of break down your targets by these different groups. Uh, uh, as we talked about before, you have some underlying uh, distribution, you might want to see um, how well your model uh, works for uh, each different group, well, and so you're not just aggregating it all together. But you know, it's kind of problematic because how do you determine which groups? A lot of the groups that have uh, that are at risk, that are vulnerable groups, are probably going to have little limited representation. Think of the example of uh, uh, loans. A lot of groups just don't apply for loans, and so there's not a lot of data there. Um, affirmative action is an interesting approach where essentially you uh, do a ranking within these different subgroups. Say you're trying to pick again with these loans. Uh, you know, you pick within these different groups. You take the top five percent of the ranked probability to um, uh, pay back the loan. Uh, you might do something similar to the example that we sh we saw before with that individual level fairness, where you have the model essentially predict the outcome uh, on a pairs of individuals that have similar traits, but you know, you might be wanting to control for something like gender or race. Um, but all this kind of a little bit falls apart when you start thinking about intersectionality, where uh, you know the white people and black people as a group are not monolithic, right? There's uh, you know white women and black women. Um, uh, there's you know white trans women and things like that. So once you start breaking it down into those pieces, it basically almost becomes impossible to ensure fairness across all sections. Um, so you know there's only so much progress you can make to a addressing this doesn't make it not worth making uh, making the effort, but uh, it's it's just to show that there's this is sort of an unending uh, pursuit. Um, 
here's some additional methods for monitoring and addressing uh, bias, stereo set uh, rates, um, different large language models, essentially ac uh, according to how much a sort of stereotype they're embedding in them. And it's really useful uh, methodology that you can take a look at. Uh, Dion from Driven Data uh, has a really interesting ethics checklist that sort of covers, uh, has like some questions you can ask yourself over sort of all stages of development. Um, interesting sources there. Um, so now I'm going to talk about a very specific sample. We're going to go back to that uh, uh, bias word embeddings. There uh, have been some methods proposed to essentially de-bias word embeddings, uh, which is a really interesting set of uh, techniques. Um, and one of those techniques is essentially uh, creating a, uh, extracting the information, the, the sort of gender vector, right? So you take pairs of gendered words, she and he, girl and boy, and you essentially subtract them from each other. And then you get, uh, as a result, this sort of uh, representation of, of gender, right? And then you can see, um, you can essentially remove that the projection of gender on things like on occupation things like babysitter or a doctor where you want to make sure that they're sort of neutral and move those to that center and then the next step is to ensure that the distance between them and their neighborhood of gendered terms is sort of equal distant. Uh, so you're basically imposing the uh, structure that you want on the embedding space which is a really interesting approach and once you apply it we're done right we fixed all bias. Bias is now gone forever. Um, I'm uh, kind of unfairly calling out this uh, article because I think it makes a very, very strong uh, kind of ambitious statement uh, that I don't particularly feel is, is warranted, um, where it says that uh, it's easier to correct bias algorithms. You just have to find the right data. Uh, you just have to apply the right data and observe, make the right observations. And those same things seem particularly hard for me. This is um, from a an author who uh, worked on a study to essentially debias this uh, healthcare allocation algorithm. Um, and it's an interesting study and they, their methodology is really interesting. And it does seem like they removed a lot of the bias in one direction, but it seems like there's opportunities for bias to emerge in other ways that uh, potentially they did not examine. Um, uh, and also, you know, this is a collaboration of researchers with a private company who was already selling this algorithm. Whether or not that company took their recommendations to actually change their algorithm is not clear. Um, and I'll get back to that point in a minute, but I want to like talk about the word embedding is the debiasing. Um, and this is going to be a kind of busy slide, uh, but to the main upshot here is that this debiasing method may have done some work, but not uh, totally remove the problem. Uh, here on the x-axis axis, you have this original bias measure where if it's uh, more positive means it's more biased towards uh, men and more negative means it's more uh, biased towards women uh, and then on the y-axis you have the number of male associated neighbors neighbors that are particularly um, associated with the male um, uh, the particularly biased towards uh, men um, and you can see the original uh, embeddings had this sort of like high, like highly they were highly correlated those two dimensions were highly correlated the more uh, bias it is the higher it's on that bias dimension the more male neighbors it has and then the debiased looks almost the same um, so the correlation uh, is reduced to some extent so there was some work being done but uh, the main point of this paper is that the bias is coded in a, all of these different words. So you can correct as many words as you want. It's still the neighborhoods of these different words have some information about the bias in them just because you're kind of feeding it bias data. Um, and so that's not to say like give up, right? Uh, it's, but I think there's a lot of questions that are worth being asked and I have some ideas for them, you know, and don't take this as, uh, you know, uh, particularly the be all end all, there's a bunch of work that's being done here and I have some resources at the end I can share. Um, but uh, think about what is the right data versus the right now data. Um, you know, just because uh, data like Reddit is makes its data very available doesn't mean uh, doesn't mean that you should ignore what Reddit is embedding in terms of the, the content that it, uh, its users produce. Um, Dion Checklist offers a lot of really powerful questions around sort of that uh, scoping uh, step. Um, thinking about what is the right method. Stereo set is a really useful thing if you're sort of considering a large language model, uh, but it's worth considering whether a large language model is particularly necessary. There's a lot of uh, complexity and obfuscation that goes into those. So, you know, definitely it needs to be used with caution. And uh, you might want to think about who might be helped and who might be harmed and how you might be able to ameliorate that. And finally, I want to kind of propose like a pretty like large question. Um, going back to that example of the, the compass uh, methodology where 
uh, it predicted higher risk for certain groups of people for uh, reoffending. Um, uh, it's worth thinking: is it is that a place that we want AI in? Do we, do we want a system that we can only make some amount of progress towards removing bias uh, to be inserted into things that can really uh, uh, jeopardize people's like liberty and, and freedom? Um, and so, it's worth making that question. And I think that question has been raised. Um, uh, recently. I, uh, I don't have too much more time, but I just want to recommend uh, reading the Stochastic Parrots paper by Bender and, and Gabru, um, which talks about these kind of big questions for NLP. And I think they're really important now to, to think about. And I think it's it's on us as practitioners to sort of think about these things. So that's it. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this is I'm really excited to be giving this talk, a uh, topic that is really important to me. Um, I have some resources here. Um, uh, hopefully we're, we'll be having some conversations in the chat, but feel free to get in touch uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.